Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar and speaking about um, rates growth in the end of the housing era. My name is Michael Atkinson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Wealth and Advice at GNF Financial Group. Uh, so at GNF, we believe that, that it's really important to connect our members with, with advice and, and solutions to help meet their financial goals. And part of that is bringing up to date information. So very pleased to um, have Brian Yu join us today. He's the Deputy Chief Economist at Central One uh, Credit Union. Uh, uh, Brian's been with Central One in the economics area there for eight years. He has a Master's of Economics from Simon Fraser University, and he is also um, has his Bachelor of Economics at the University of Manitoba. So I'm going to pass it over to Brian. He's going to speak about the housing market. Um, we know real estate is a hot topic in the Lower Mainland right now. So I'll pass it over to Brian. Thanks. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much, Michael, and thanks for GNF for uh, hosting this webinar and for everyone on the call uh, that took the time out of their day to, uh, to uh, attend this call. Uh, so today, I'm gonna, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, we're going to be looking at um, the housing market, largely everybody's favorite topic, Metro Vancouver. Um, and it's a market that has really gone, undergone a lot of change uh, over the past year uh, with sales falling, uh, prices softening. And, and what we're going to do today is take a quicker, uh, sort of a deeper uh, look at the state of the market, uh, some of the drivers, and how we think it will evolve over the next two years, uh, particularly in the context of the, uh, the current rate environment, interest rate environment, as well as the regional economic trends. So, well, we are calling it as uh, sort of the rates growth, and you know, the question is, is this the head of the, the housing era in terms of the market uh, and, um, and uh, the period of rapid growth that we've seen in, uh, in recent years? Um, so, so the first one, so we'll take a quick look at the trends first. So the broader trends in the, uh, uh, the market uh, here show what we have in blue here is the Canadian uh, real estate sales or MLS home sales, uh, as well as the BC numbers for the province as a whole, uh, going back to about 2012. And what we're seeing here is that we've had a pretty strong, uh, we had a pretty strong pace uh, in 2017 as we moved in through the year, uh, a rising trend in, in overall sales, both nationally as well as um, at the provincial level. Um, and what we're seeing here is now that since about since 2018, um, we have seen a big drop off in the overall sales environment. You have uh, overall um, Canadian sales dropping, uh, BC sales are actually dropping at a much more rapid pace. And this is across country. If we look across, um, you know, Ontario, Toronto, we've seen uh, a weakening in overall sales conditions, and largely as a result of some of the federal change or uh, some changes made at the federal level uh, related to uh, to uh, availability of financing for. Um, for mortgages. Uh, here in Metro Vancouver area, uh, what we do see is that uh, the overall sales have slumped more than 30% since the beginning of the year, a, a really a significant drop off. If we look at some of the numbers, what, is it, uh, what does it say? It's the, uh, you essentially have the, the Metro Vancouver uh, sales dropping from about 5,300 units, so that's about 64,000 annualized pace to about 3,300 uh, per month or 40,000 units annualized. Um, we see a little bit of a bottoming the trend uh, that has picked up since about June, but overall we're trending at the levels last seen in about uh, 2014 for the sale. Uh, the market turn has largely been driven by those, uh, the combination of those of tightening federal lending requirements, uh, but also provincial policy. Uh, we're gonna come through, go through all of these uh, in the next few slides, uh, slowing of economic growth, as well as a, a higher interest rate environment. And if we compare uh, the Metro Vancouver region to um, some of the other markets here, you do have that the lower mainland market. So this is the combined Metro Vancouver as well as Abbotsford Mission area, uh, seeing a much steeper drop relative to other major markets. You do see here from peak uh, December 2017 uh, to July 2018, so the, the monthly trend has fallen roughly about uh, 40% in overall sales activity. Toronto has dropped about 20%, but uh, the, the Toronto story is a little interesting just because they also had another shock uh, prior, earlier in 2017, as the, uh, the provincial government also announced a number of tightening measures uh, to, uh, 
uh, to uh, lower demand in that market as well. So prices in the, the lower mainland area has, have turned over. We've seen uh, generally a, a softening. If we look at some of the, the, uh, the measures of prices that we typically look at, um, you have seen about a 3% drop off in benchmark MLS prices, uh, or the, um, uh, here it's called the, the detached bench or the townhouse bench uh, price. Uh, we've also seen a, a more of a significant drop in the, uh, the uh, city of Vancouver. Uh, detached home prices have fallen a little bit more than both townhomes and apartments, reflecting some of the higher prices and uh, the greater impacts of the federal lending rest uh, restrictions. Uh, in areas like the city of Vancouver, especially on the west side or the west, uh, Vancouver West, as well as the West Vancouver uh, District Municipality, uh, you are seeing drops of about 10% in year-over-year -year prices. So there is uh, some uh, dispersion among uh, where areas, uh, what types of areas are seeing uh, more uh, sharper price declines. But largely, higher price luxury products have seen a, a bigger drop-off in overall uh, the pricing conditions in uh, uh, this year. <clears throat> So what comes next? Uh, what are we expecting for the economy, or sorry, expecting for the housing market? Um, so our view of the of the housing market is largely that the current economic, the current environment of the very soft sales patterns uh, is likely to persist. We're going to see a little bit of an uptick. I think that the end of uh, some of the policy measures are going to uh, dissipate, and we're going to see a slight uh, increase in the sales environment, but it's still going to be pretty sluggish. And we do expect to see a further correction in the in home prices. However, it's not going to be a crash in our view, uh, and there's going to be uh, some good reasons why we think that it's going to be a, a pretty moderate, uh, a modest correction in in the market uh, by the time this is all said and done. <coughs> so, first off, I think we should take a look at some of the the key factors that have uh, precipitated the decline, and uh, we think these factors are still going to be in play going forward. Uh, first off is the, uh, the federal lending restrictions. Um, uh, if you are, um, uh, this impacts, of course, federally regulated lenders, parts of your banks, but also uh, you'll see that across the board, you've seen a tightening up of, of credit availability uh, across whether it's uh, across lending institutions for various reasons, including things like securitization and mortgage-backed securities. Um, but in generally, we did see up to uh, an impact of up to 20%, I think, on purchasing power for certain buyers who were uh, looking for a home. Uh, really, the, that, uh, that is those, those, that's for those buyers who may have had just enough of a down payment to, uh, to breach a 20% threshold, who didn't need to not have CMHC or, or uh, uh, mortgage insurance or other mortgage insurance, uh, and they're not able to get a, an additional um, uh, bridge the required down payment through uh, other types of uh, financial assets or other types of savings. So there was a big drop off, I think, for some buyers. Not all buyers were impacted by about 20%. We've also seen this add to, however, um, uh, posted mortgage rates or effective mortgage rates in the market. Um, this, of course, impacted the, the general uh, um, purchasing power for a lot of households. And that's, I think, the key trigger of uh, this drop off in overall uh, sales and demand. Um, adding to this, of course, is a, a, a really the plethora of government policies that to constrain demand, and some of these were already in place. Um, last year, we, we had already seen the foreign buyer tax, at least for the Metro Vancouver area. In the latest BC budget, this was expanded towards other types of other markets in the area as well, the capital region, Central Okanagan, Nanaimo, uh, those now have a foreign buyer tax. Uh, also, there was, um, uh, I think, some negative impact of the anticipation of a speculation tax on, uh, on, uh, on property. Uh, for, for example, 2% of uh, these were impacting individuals who had vacation homes, but are also those who were foreign investors with satellite families, um, uh, and also Alberta buyers. Those, those are the types of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of household or uh, uh, buyer that were impacted by potential for speculation tax. Uh, High-valued homes are also seen to have a, a, higher, um, a higher tax rate as well on their property taxes. Uh, so there's been a number of these, uh, at least provincial as well as municipal um, uh, policies that have come into play over the last year, year and a half that really just added to, uh, I think, for the, those uh, lending requirements. Uh, anything really in the budget, uh, I think, further accelerated that downturn relative to other markets. <clears throat> Adding to this, of course, more recently, the rental investment markets um, have seen, uh, I think, a little bit more uh, less uh, demand for the investor side of the market as well due to uh, some vacant clause eliminations, 
increased tenant protections around them evictions, as well as the government limits the maximum of the rent hike of PPI. Uh, so as a, an investor basis, there might have been um, um, buyers, potential buyers who've stepped out of the market because uh, they don't see maybe the, uh, the, the investment returns being as, as positive as they, as they were in the past as well. So there's, I think there's just a number of, of these factors that have been uh, uh, rolled, into the, uh, rolled into the demand uh, side of the equation. Uh, adding to this has been interest rate profile. Uh, we have seen a, a broad increase in, uh, in uh, interest rates for effective household interest rates. So these include all consumer, uh, consumer loans, um, other types of uh, not only uh, uh, mortgages, but also things like car loans and things like that have seen a, a hike in rates as the Bank of Canada has been hiking as well. Uh, you've seen the mortgage rates uh, increase since about January 2018. We're now essentially back to where we were in about that 2014 period uh, uh, in terms of the, the posted mortgage rates. So these are all adding together to, to make it relatively less affordable uh, for, I think, for a lot of households to try to get into the market in a status quo pricing environment. Um, when we look at the, the outlook for interest rates, we are expecting it to continue to rise. Um, when, well, some of the, the variables that we, uh, we are assessing is really a state of the, of the broader economy when we're looking at uh, interest rates in the national economy, nothing really local. Uh, and what we're seeing here on the uh, interest rate side is that globally, you know, economic growth generally is still positive. We, we undoubtedly have a, uh, a deviation or a divergence in current trends um, uh, in terms of the global economy, suggesting there is some pockets of weakness, uh, especially given the uh, current U.S. and China tariff wars uh, that is impacting emerging markets. But overall, I think that the environment is still positive, uh, and that tends to um, tends to for, uh, to precede um, a general tightening of, of uh, interest rates and monetary policy going forward. And, and largely here is that when we see the uh, the U.S. economy, um, the economy has been growing at a very rapid pace in uh, uh, in the U.S. The latest numbers are about 4.2% in the second quarter. Uh, and again, it's, it's broad growth in terms of residential investment, the business sector. They're seeing uh, consumer demand being very strong. Um, really reflecting areas like uh, a very low interest, a low um, unemployment rate, job growth, uh, and the like. Uh, we're not we're not anticipating that the U.S. will need to grow at at that three and a half four percent rate. Uh, we are looking to see a gradual deceleration to around a two and a half to two percent range. Uh, still quite solid, um, uh, and at least lifted in part by uh, U.S. Uh, tax cuts. Um, this this here are the uh, unemployment rates. Uh, in blue for the uh, uh, like the blue for the uh, U.S. Uh, labor market, you see it, it is trending roughly in sub four percent, very very strong, very very tight labor market. Um, and you're also seeing that the inflationary pressures are are, are somewhat steady. They're, they're around that two percent range for uh, um, personal consumption expenditure inflation. And you're also looking at wage growth uh, picking up a little bit. So. The, the current conditions in the, in the U.S. are, are really for uh, an almost a full employment type of situation, very little capacity constraint, almost an overheating type of, a, of an economy right now. And that is going to put upward pressure on their, uh, their uh, benchmark rates in the U.S. as well as uh, the 10-year bond yield. And, and these typically, if we look at how many hikes, we see about three hikes by the U.S. Federal Reserve in 2019. And that's going to put upward pressure also on Canadian um, uh, yields as well, primarily because they are somewhat of a, a substitute in terms of financial markets, and institutions tend to price off of these types of um, these types of rates. Um, here in Canada, the numbers are also steady. We had a solid gain of 2.9 percent in the in terms of gross domestic product in the uh, second quarter. Um, those numbers are expected to, to ease off. We are expecting to see some slowdown in the uh, in the Canadian economy, largely as the, the broader housing market. We've already seen those housing numbers I showed you before. Uh, that is going to lead to, uh, is already leading to some slowdown in the consumer cycle as well as the, the residential investment cycle. We expect to see housing starts and, uh, and housing investments overall being slower than it has been in, in recent years. Uh, nonetheless, though, I, I, uh, the numbers are still quite uh, strong in terms of and really suggestive that we're going to see further rate hikes by the Bank of Canada and in an overall interest rate cycle. Um, this here is what we look at. It's called uh, uh, the, 
uh, actual potential GDP. It's, uh, it's just really looking at what the economy is currently producing, uh, or the, in the, I guess, the purplish blue line here, versus what it could produce in the uh, given all of its um, uh, capital machinery and labor, so its potential growth. Um, and typically, when the blue line or the purple line falls below it, uh, we would say that there's a lot of capacity in the market and uh, there's no real need for um, uh, rate hikes because we're operating below what we could. But as you can see here, as we've converged over 2017-2018, uh, capacity in the Canadian economy has, has largely been uh, has largely dissipated. We're essentially operating what we would call near full employment and uh, a full capacity in the Canadian economy. And for the Bank of Canada, that's really just a signal for them. It's a signal that um, there's uh, there's uh, that things are tightening up. Uh, wages are, are likely on a rise. We're starting to see some inflationary pressures, and it's time, of course, to, to hike rates and to in order to uh, facilitate some of this um, uh, this uh, this um, lack of capacity in the economy. Um, so that's really what we're seeing. So the inflationary pressures that we're offering roughly around um, close to about 2.8% uh, more recently, uh, they've, that's fallen off. The most recent numbers came back to about, I believe, around 2.2 uh, or so. So a little bit of a slowdown in the, in the inflationary pressure, but still well above the target or the headline numbers, uh, headline target of about 2%. And more importantly, on your right here, um, this is what the Bank of Canada looks like for, looks at primarily for, uh, uh, in assessing where inflation is heading and, and underlying inflation. Uh, inflationary pressures are roughly trending around that close to that 2% range right now. That's really right where the Bank of Canada wants it. And given that rise and given the lack of capacity in the economy, uh, we are fully anticipating um, a rate hiking, uh, rate hikes that come in the, uh, in the quarters ahead. Um, the, the next one is likely going to be happening in uh, very likely on well tomorrow, uh, October 24th, uh, we do expect to see a 25 basis point hike. Um, following that, there's a lot of questions of uncertainty of whether or not and how quickly the bank can the may hike. Uh, one thing to note is that a lot of the the risks that the Bank of Canada had previously um, had, had previously noted, particularly in the trade scenario, have kind of gone by the wayside. Um, the uh, the agreement for a United States Mexico Canada agreement in place of the former NAFTA agreement uh, means that uh, the export risk is kind of pushed off. Also, there's more likelihood that we'll see some greater certainty related to capital investments in Canada. Uh, and taking away that type of a risk, uh, and given the Bank of Canada's prior communications, means that they should be on a on a greater hiking cycle going forward. Uh, there are risks, negative risks, however, for this. Uh, U.S.-China trade risks are uh, uh, could potentially derail some of the e uh, economic growth that we're seeing, global growth, and we are seeing signs of that right now. Uh, and for Canada, which has a little bit more exposure to China, that does mean that uh, it is a negative risk for our exports like on that end. Um, so right now, we're still looking at roughly around the 1%, maybe 2%. So the markets are actually looking at a 2 to 3, two to three hikes next year. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of debate I think right now how much will the Bank of Canada hike uh, in 2019? But we do know that that is the bias. They will be moving in 2019 positively. Uh, we currently have a 25 basis point hike in about mid year. That's uh, and it's very likely I think that we'll probably move that to two hikes uh, for the year as a whole. Uh, and that is, of course, going to be putting some upward pressure on the overall inflationary, uh, on all the overall interest rate profile uh, over the next couple of years. Um, so on the interest rate side, that's uh, what we're looking at. So uh, definitely a tightening for households. Households will be facing um, higher rates going forward, and we'll also be looking at uh, basically finding it more expensive to get a loan. Um, adding that to that is a B20 like regulation. Um, mortgage rates, of course, are going to be tempered by competition. However, in our view, that it's not all going to pass through into much higher mortgage rates. They are going to rise, but it's going to be a lot of competition for rates as well. Uh, when we look at the economic conditions, I think that while the, the rate conditions are, are definitely against our headwinds for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the housing market, but we do note that the economy has generally performed quite, uh, quite remarkably, actually, in recent years, and that should at the very least, uh, uh, filter into 2018, 2019 to at least moderate growth levels. 
Uh, BC has largely outperformed um, all other provinces over the last few years. We're averaging more than 3% growth for the last four years. Uh, and we've seen the last year that about 3.9% um, um, uh, gross domestic product growth or, or economic growth. Uh, that's been generally well above the rest of the, of the of the provinces. And if we look at Vancouver in particular, uh, some of the employment numbers we've seen over the recent years have been exceptionally strong, where you have uh, almost 8% growth in overall employment for 2015 to 2017. Um, comparatively, if you look at Montreal, which is the, was the, sort of the closest large market, it's about 5%. Toronto is only about 3.5%. Uh, we've seen a lot of jobs being, uh, being created, and that has underpinned a lot of that housing uh, demand in recent years, adding to, again, a low rate environment, as well as other factors in the market. Um, the economic drivers in Vancouver, I think they're still quite solid. We still have a lot of residential, non-residential construction activity occurring. Uh, the investments have been strong. Exports in BC overall have been strong. Uh, so uh, we have seen a technology sector is kind of expanding and also creating a lot of jobs as well. Um, this has been, I think, I think the most prominent, uh, some of the announcements have been from WeWork, Amazon uh, taking over the Canada Post building, and, uh, or at least the, uh, taking over that space, and now they're renovating the space uh, to house, uh, I think in Vancouver we're going to have about anywhere from 5,000 Amazon workers at, uh, in the next few years if we aren't there already. Uh, we've also seen generally professional services, technology expansion, all uh, being key drivers in Vancouver. Um, we've also, of course, had the tourism cycle has been very strong in, in the region, um, and movie and film, TV and film have, um, have also been creating a lot of jobs in the area. Um, as we go forward, though, I think that like the Canadian picture, we are expecting to see a, a, a little bit of a slowdown in the growth cycle. Uh, a lot of those factors I just mentioned in Vancouver are, are still going to be positive, I think, uh, but the where is that uh, the broader economy is going to see the housing cycle slow. Um, a little slower pace of hiring as well as commodity cycle investments. Uh, so this is again, this is the provincial numbers as a whole. So you need to be a little bit wary that the uh, the lower mainland and Metro Vancouver does differ quite a bit in in uh, growth from the the rest of the province. Um, the more recent numbers, like I, I did mention that we've had seen that uh, eight percent growth in employment over, over a two year period. Um, but what we've seen this year has been a, a clear deceleration in the in the growth cycle. Uh, in fact, we've, if you look at some of the numbers, it can suggest that Vancouver may have lost 40,000 jobs over the first half of the year. But it's very, you got to be very careful about the, uh, these numbers because uh, there is a lot of random errors and some sampling error within the, uh, within the, within the values. Um, and not all of it is just due to uh, people in the area not working. Sometimes it is uh, because uh, people are, um, uh, people are generally taking on uh, maybe fewer part-time jobs or, or um, some of these individuals may be, uh, there, there may be fewer workers in the area due to the types of uh, projects in the area. Uh, here, a thing to note though, is that the lower mainland Southwest area, uh, despite the fact that we've had those that kind of that overall job loss, it still has a very low unemployment rate. We're looking at anywhere from close to about 5%. And in the lower mainland, it's even lower, I'm talking about that, in the, in the 4% or the, the Vancouver metro area is around 4%. And this is still below uh, where we are uh, provincially. And when we look at those numbers, it, it does suggest to us that uh, what's kind of hampering, potentially hampering the, uh, the Vancouver metro labor market is not so much a lack of jobs. Uh, I think this could be just a lack of uh, a lack of insufficient number of people um, and the inf insufficient level of labor given the unemployment rate. Uh, the retail sales growth cycle has slowed uh, in the area. So we are seeing that softening. But again, this is a reflection of, a, of, those, of those employment numbers that we saw. Um, but it isn't really clear to me, though, even at this point in time, given some of the numbers, that we've actually seen a lot of job losses in the Vancouver metro area. Uh, there's a number of different estimates for population in, in, or of uh, employment in BC. Uh, and one of them is with the labor force numbers that we just saw, that's based on place of residence uh, versus place of work. Uh, if we look at the another measure of uh, employment, payroll, and hours, so these are actual companies that have jobs in the area. Uh, and in BC, we see that although the BC numbers have been treading water this year, uh, the overall numbers by, uh, by employer is actually up about 3%. So uh, there is some divergence in, this, uh, in these numbers. Uh, and one of the other indicators about the state of the market, I think, is largely when we're looking at things like job vacancy rates. Uh, job vacancy rates uh, in, uh, Vancouver, in Vancouver area, so you see that's about um, midpoint in this chart, 
uh, are actually very high. It means that people are generally or, or companies aren't really able to find a sufficient amount of labor for their uh, for their operations. And we've seen examples of this in the news, but um, well, when we look at the the numbers, they're well above other um, um, other uh, regions in BC. And BC as a whole, at, four, at over four uh, percent, is well above the Canadian average. So it, it really suggests to me that what's what's hampering uh, the the labor market and job is actually not so much the um, the the labor force as much of it, it is actually just the um, the inability of potentially some individuals who don't have enough uh, the skill proper skill set for the jobs that are available. Um, and we are seeing that also being influenced in areas like the wages. Wage growth in the region is actually quite high. Uh, we've been tracking roughly around four to five percent uh, in uh, in hourly average average hourly wage growth in the uh, the BC as a whole. A lot of that, of course, I think being driven by uh, some of those technology sectors. There's also some commodities, but overall, I think that the Metro Vancouver is driving a lot of this number as well as Victoria. Um, and average hourly wage growth by province, if you see on the right here, um, is exceptionally high. Again, we this is not a signal of, of, of a weak economy by any means. It's just a constrained economy uh, that has insufficient labor right now for the, the jobs that are available. Uh, population levels in the in the uh, Vancouver CMA is actually still quite solid. We're still averaging roughly around 40,000. I think this number is actually uh, has probably increased in 2018 as well. I think provincial we had a big increase in the number of students and also work permits, uh, and we're probably going to see a big increase in uh, this number once they actually roll out. But overall, I think we're steady. We're averaging roughly around 40,000 people per year. Uh, a lot of it being driven by international inflows. So you'll be able to take a look at this if you want to go back, but basically our, our outlook here is that we are looking at, in terms of the economy, it's still pretty solid uh, for BC and, and what we view it for Vancouver as a whole. Uh, we're really tracking around that uh, mid-2% two to almost uh, mid two range of our forecast period, uh, and we do expect to see employment growth start to pick up again in 2019 as we see uh, higher population flows starting to re be released into the labor force, um, new immigrants getting, uh, getting adapting to, um, to Canada, and again, uh, moving into um, looking for work uh, over time. And that should help to bridge some of our issues with the, uh, the low unemployment. But we still see quite a bit of a, a wage pressure uh, emerging in the, in the region. So when we add to that, those together, we're looking at the, the rate environment, which I think is negative uh, for housing. We look at the, um, the, in terms of sales and pricing, uh, we look at the policy environment, which is negative, and the and I would say the economy is is kind of a mixed bag. It is slower growth than it was in prior years, but still solid, and we're still seeing quite a bit of consumer demand uh, for the housing market. I think again, those are the environmental themes. Broadly, I think that's still on net negative from, from where we were in the past few years, and that's really going to be uh, supportive of a of a demand, but a decelerated activity from uh, from recent years' pace. Uh, our expectation is that we're going to see um, uh, MLS uh, sales activity start roughly around, uh, probably down about 20% this year in terms of overall uh, sales environment before um, um, moving slightly higher. Again, these are, these are levels that are consistent with about uh, the 2012 period, 2012 to 2014 period, uh, which would be considered, I think, uh, relatively weak, especially given that the population has grown over that period as well. Um, the chill is likely to continue across product markets. I think that we've already seen this big drop off in the single detached home market. Uh, actually, really since about 2016, when we had a rapid price increase um, that uh, led to a major affordability erosion, a big drop off in, in single family homes. Uh, and then, of course, with the new B20 measures, really it's, it's kind of pushed a lot of potential buyers out of the market, especially in a, in a higher price market like Vancouver. Um, the townhome market has been relatively more stable. Apartment homes have also come off quite a bit as well. But I think there's still going to be quite a bit of demand for apartment and townhomes as a whole, uh, just because they're a more affordable product. Uh, and if you are getting into a market, and these individuals might be having to readapt their uh, households may need to readapt in terms of their preferences, uh, just because of the affordability problems that are now especially emerging after some of the, the, the latest changes of policy. Um, we do, however, see a uh, ongoing buyer's market uh, uh, for the detached market as well. We're seeing um, uh, that has occurred, of course, since about 2016 as well, a big drop off in sales. And now we're looking at a buyer's market for um, a detached market right now. We are seeing signs that prices continue to drop 
uh, for detached homes. Uh, and we do expect to see um, as a whole that will lead uh, the overall price declines. How much? I think that uh, the the price declines we're seeing in a uh, sort of peak to trough type of environment for the uh, uh, for the benchmark pricing that I mentioned previously is somewhere in the, anywhere up to 10 percent, I think, uh, from peak. So that we're we've been roughly around three four percent, so probably about a six percent drop off in the benchmark prices. I think that the detached home prices are are, are likely going to see a little bit more of a moderation. Um, and again, it's a very slow type of a market for that environment. Um, the uh, attached apartments are also starting to, again, show some of that negative trend as well as they move into a more balanced condition after being red hot essentially in, 28, in early 2018 and 2017. Uh, so the price levels have peaked and we are looking for, again, that, that drop off. But is this a crash? I think the question is, uh, is this going to be more than just a sort of a moderate correction or moderate correction we've seen in the past? Uh, well, I think that undoubtedly we are looking at active listings who have that have arisen um, over uh, the numbers have been are up sharply since the beginning of the year and in, in terms of overall inventory levels in the resale market which again is, is going is putting pressure on uh, home prices especially given the low demand cycle but we should note that new listings or the flow of listings hasn't really increased all that much in fact it's actually been pretty low uh, and and that goes back to the economy there's no there's nothing really pushing um, a lot of uh, buy or existing owners to sell. So the vast majority don't have to sell. Uh, they see a slow market, they kind of just sit on the wayside. There are, of course, going to be those who do have to sell, people who have to move, people who are who really want to downsize and want to get out of the market, investors in some cases who are feeling their, their investments not working. Um, and they are putting their, their homes on the market or those properties on the market. And that is, again, pushing up that inventory level as well. But overall, I, I think that uh, the, the, there's little evidence that we're seeing a big, sharp, um, shock in terms of the uh, of, a, of a big slow uh, uh, a deluge of a uh, of a uh, of, uh, in, of inventory hitting the market um one area to note though that inventories are quite high or potential inventory is actually quite high in the new home market so there's a lot of condos under construction record level uh 2019 should be a year and that we're going to see more uh, of those condos really completing um that does mean that some of those uh, those investment units that were bought as a pre-sale uh, are going to come onto the market, and that is going to put some pressure onto, uh, I think, in terms of the inventory listings. You're also going to see the the aspect that some people may not be able to close on their products just because of the the new lending rules. Um, well, we do expect us to see this having a negative impact on housing starts going forward. We can easily see, uh, I think, the housing starts could fall five, ten percent per year or next couple of years, still from high levels, and they are going to decelerate. But overall, that the the trend right now in terms of the new home market should also follow what's happening in the in the resale condition. Um, as a whole, though, uh, the median price growth because we're talking about peak to trough five ten or about up to ten percent in the peak to trough scenario for the housing prices, we still expect to see on the median price for the average for the annual uh, number still only being around negative two three percent. Uh, but again, within those numbers is a, a peak to trough decline of a, of a more substantial magnitude. Um, and this is going to continue. If we look at where a, a sort of a scenario in which prices have kind of been in a very flat environment, uh, I would say last time was largely 1995, 2000. Uh, if we were to look for what kind of a scenario would drive us into a much more of a deeper, uh, a deeper um, price decline, I think we would also need, we would generally need a recession or some type of external event uh, that would impact uh, the, uh, um, the employment cycle uh, and really create a lot of job loss in the market. And, and at this point, we don't see that happening. We see that, uh, a pretty status quo or even a, a moderate growth type of environment uh, for BC and Metro Vancouver as a whole. Um, Another area, of course, in the housing market is the rental market. One issue is affordability. We've seen substantial growth in uh, of about five percent, over five percent growth in um, average rent uh, in recent years. On a on a same, uh, these are called the uh, um, uh, same uh, sort of a same unit basis uh, or same sample basis. Um, the vacancy rates are very low, roughly around 1%. And there has been a little bit of an increase in the number of units that have been brought onto market for rental properties. Uh, but again, the 1% suggests a pretty much a, uh, a very tight, um, uh, a tight market and there's no vacancies really in the region. And the, the latest changes to the B20 measures uh, and the lending ones that have constrained people from getting to the housing market 
uh, could also create a scenario where there's going to be even more demand for rental apartments and rental property going forward. Um, that being said, though, for individuals who are already in a unit, you know, they're going to be constrained by, or the rents are going to be constrained by uh, the uh, overall um, uh, rent, uh, uh, rent growth uh, allowance by the provincial government, which is at, really sitting at inflation right now. But for those who are moving or those who are trying to get into a, un a new unit, they should expect to see substantial, uh, I think, um, uh, rental growth over the next uh, over the next year. And again, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it as anywhere in that five six percent range from where they may have been in the prior unit and even more. Um, vacancy rates generally are, are very low across the across the uh, uh, across the metro area. Uh, and again, I don't really see this uh, uh, letting up anytime soon. We have at least 2017. You, you essentially had that 1% rate was very well, with the lowest rates in like Vancouver City. Um, you, you also saw that Richmond has had uh, sub 1% rates in, in the in vacancy rates. Um, New Westminster had a little more rental production, uh, and we have seen a little bit of an increase, but still, uh, generally speaking, a very low type of a, of a, a vacancy rate environment, so a tight market overall. Um, we are expecting to see, as I mentioned before, the overall um, housing market show roughly about 20% drop off in sales this year. Uh, after 10% drop last year in the Vancouver CMA. Uh, we expect that to see a very much a very marginal increase next year. Median prices are, are going to be uh, on the decline, um, uh, despite the fact that we do have a, uh, a pretty solid um, um, economic environment underpinning this, really being driven by the, the, um, uh, the higher interest rates as well as the, the policy measures. Um, so no, I, yeah, so, so overall, you know, I, I think that we are, uh, in that softening environment, I don't, I don't think it's going to change. I think we're we're really looking at a sort of a multi-year period in which um, I, I guess buyers are, will be will be facing essentially a very soft environment for uh, for sale. Tends to be in a rush in any way to buy a pro purchase a property, um, and again they're going to be facing some constraints how to get into the market. Um, so happy to take any questions uh, via the, the chat box and um, um, and uh, yeah and uh, hear any of your thoughts as well on. Uh, on the on the presentation. Well, with that, then I think um, we'll let uh, let you go. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Brian. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. I think it, I think uh, myself going through it, I found it very valuable, and I hope uh, everybody uh, enjoyed it as well and find it valuable as well. Um, we will post this webinar on uh, gffg.com so you could see it at a later time or you can share it with friends or family. And of course, if you have any uh, questions, um, please feel free to come in and see us and we'll sit down with you and uh, talk about your current circumstances. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon.